Okay, good evening, everyone. So uh, my name is Harvey Kennedy Pitt, um, and I would like to just welcome you for and thank you for being on time. It's always um, a privilege to be in these spaces, but I think we take it for granted when we have people come into spaces, and uh, you know we are we are not appreciative of of, of your timeliness. So we really appreciate you taking the time to be here um, in good time uh, and just for your interest in this event. Um, so as I mentioned. Um, my name is Harvey Kennedy Pitt. I'm the CEO and founding director of Black Beetle Health. Um, and this was just a vision. And I think that tonight's really um, an important um, uh, sort of um, uh, milestone for us, really, as an organization, just because we have, we sort of came from really nothing, you know, and um, we've worked together and put our heads together and used our creativity to really um, make um, what we see as um, the report tonight. Um, now, I, uh, can't go without sort of acknowledging all of the hard work that's gone in from um, across the team. Um, and I just wanted to just, um, for those who might not be aware of who Black Beetle Health are or what we do, give you a, a brief synopsis of who we are and, and what makes us tick. So we are a public health community charity um, that focuses on the intersection of LGBTQ plus identities and um, what it means to be a racial or ethnic minority in this country, so racially or sexually minoritized individual, um, and really figuring out you know, where the barriers might exist, um, what is lacking, where are the gaps, what needs to be done, and how we can um, be better advocates for those in our community, and as well for ourselves, um, as well as for ourselves, um, because um, for many of us who um, are a part of this organization, this is our story as well. And so I'd like to give you a warm welcome this evening and thank you for your interest in the work that we do. I hope that tonight will be beneficial and that it will add some value to the work that you do. Um, the idea of this report is to be a building block. It's just a foundation. It's not necessarily a perfect piece of work. It's something that we're very proud of, but it's not necessarily something that's perfect. But we have definitely put our blood, sweat and tears into it with the resources that we've had. And we hope that that will come through um, in tonight's um, dialogue over the next um, 55 minutes or so. So just a bit of a brief um, overview of today's um, agenda. So we're going to do three sections. Um, the first section is going to be focusing on the work that we do. Um, the second will be the report itself, um, which will be much um, sort of the, the, the meat of today's um, event. And of course, a bit of a call to action, which will be both happening throughout um, the sections, but also looking at um, uh, to, toward the end of the presentation. What is, what is the ask? What is the call to action? And how can we start to implement um, the, uh, the recommendations that are highlighted in this report? So a bit about the work that we've done um, is going to be highlighted by King, who's not actually with us this evening um, as another engagement, but um, uh, he um, will have been the voice of our impact video, um, which you might have come across over the past sort of four to, four to six months um, when that was promoted. So I'm just going to play that now uh, and give you a brief overview of some of our work up until, I believe, um, May or June of this year. Um, uh, and hopefully that will give you a good summary. Here it goes. Black Beetle Health is going the distance to ensure LGBTQ plus Black and people of color are equipped with the health information they need to thrive in a world not necessarily created for their success. As an organization, we have set out to promote health, well-being, and equality through evidence-based, peer-reviewed health education and resource development by addressing health misinformation, educating our communities on health and well-being topics, signposting to culturally safe health and well-being services for LGBTQ plus people of color throughout the UK, and empowering individuals within our community to become more informed decision makers. Since our inception in June of 2019, we have delivered over 60 health and well-being presentations, which more than 2,000 people have attended, created four culturally safe health guides, and a complete series of quarterly newsletters. We have distributed over 70 care packages and dedicated over 1,800 health promotion hours as a team to deliver our collective service to our amazing funders, trustees, board of advisors, team members, and you, our supporters. Thank you for enabling us to do more, reach more, and be more for LGBTQ plus Black and people of color across the UK. To learn more and to access our resources, visit our website at www.blackbeetlehealth.co.uk. Okay, fantastic. So that was a bit from, from King, who's our operations coordinator and makes uh, all the wheels turn and keeps them all lubed up. We're now going to move across to um, Dr. Sami Sundarajan, um, who will tell us a bit about why we've done this report. Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you, Javi. Uh, so as Javi said, uh, I'm Dr. Saumya Sundar Rajan, and I am the health promotion coordinator here at Black Beetle Health. So 
when we speak about why we conducted this uh, report for LGBTQ plus uh, black people of color. So whilst we were doing our research in, in, in just a very you know, general sense, we came across a huge gap where we, we realized that there, there were definitely health disparities among the LGBTQ plus black people of color. But also we found out that there was data missing. So we weren't able to you know, sort of like put two together to find out exactly why there was data missing and you know, what we could do uh, for that. And we know that the existing health interventions that's there for the, uh, you know, the, the ratio of sexual minorities, they have, uh, they have definitely been designed uh, earlier on and it, it hasn't sort of like changed to adapt to all of, all of the you know, different uh, practitioners that's there, the different changing lifestyles or, or any other different services that that's available. And most of these uh, interventions that, you know, when, that we have come across in our research, they were probably you know, designed by uh, people who do not identify as LGBTQ, people who are not from the racial um, you know, minority um, sector. So it, it is very difficult to sort of see them uh, deciding that, okay, this is the kind of treatment that you want, or this is the kind of thing that you should be doing. So we definitely saw a gap there. And that is what we wanted to do to sort of like fill in the gap to try and figure out, go back into the root cause of it and try and figure out why this has occurred. And we have also seen that it has al al always been like, you know, very falsely assumed that uh, the, the integrity of the health interventions of the ratio of sexual minorities is, it is automatically preserved through the utilization of practitioners who, like I said, who identify as either, you know, racial ethnic minority or a sexual minority, but there has definitely been a gap in when you when you speak about you know cultural safety training and there definitely has been a lot of examples that we have seen you know in our day-to-day -day lives as well you know us as uh, being uh, public health practitioners but also on the other side as well where we access the service that there definitely exists uh, a gap wherein two are not able to meet so this was our major, uh, you know, uh, major force in, in like, you know, okay, we need to do this report. We need to fill in the gap. We know that there is a problem here. What can we do as an organization, as an organization that speaks, uh, you know, uh, for, for the uh, LGBTQ plus black people of color, uh, for an organization that has a vision of helping people, enabling people to be better, to, you know, to, to provide them with, uh, with evidence-based peer-reviewed research material for them to be able to make informed decisions what can we do so that is where we came up with this in uh, you know making a study making a report and actually the the findings that we've seen you know you you will see later on in this presentation as well they were appalling i mean we did not exactly expect to find such findings but uh, we were also a little taken aback you know it's like being in this service for so long there definitely is some parts that not just us, but so many different organizations, so many different people have overlooked over time. It could either be because, you know, because maybe they didn't know that this existed, or maybe they probably did not want to come out of their comfort zone and do something that hasn't been done before, you know? So this has been, uh, it, it definitely, it, it was definitely a huge vision for us as well. And there were times where we didn't know if we would be able to reach the, you know, the final goal. and actually be able to provide something that's that's very substantial and has a lot of matter and i would say the team has come come across and we have so many different specialties across the team and i don't think we would be able to have done it without uh, their help and all of us coming together for just one cause and each of us being trained in different specialties actually helped a lot because we were able to uh, not only speak about it from a practitioner perspective and not only speak about it from just the data that we have seen online doing all of the research, but also from, uh, from like, I, like I mentioned before, uh, from a user perspective as well, because we have used those services, you know, at least like sometime in our life. So it, it, it definitely, this, this report definitely has like an all around uh, perspective of, of the health disparities that's there. The, the existing health interventions that's there for LGBTQ uh, black people of color. And it was very important for us to look at different perspectives, you know, uh, because this research, we, we truly believe that this is very, very valuable, especially when it comes to representation of the LGBTQ plus black people of color. And 
and yeah i mean there's definitely there is a lack of existing data which actually tells you uh, what the issue is or or tells you what the danger uh, that it 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 is I'm probably lying you know um, in wait for for people because because we are already know i mean being uh, being identifying as lgbtq will definitely put you in a marginalized sex, uh, section and identifying as a black person of color will definitely marginalize you even further within you know the wider community and and like our ceo um, Harvey always says you are uh, a not marginalized community, but you are being marginalized. If I'm saying that right, Harvey, and and I mean that that's completely true. And if if we as as an organization that stands for LGBTQ plus Black people of color, their rights, the the, the voice, and actually believing in um, that empowerment, if when we are able to figure out an issue lying there, and if we don't do something about it, then who are we really? You know, so that drove us even further to do something about it and and in this report you will definitely see that we have definitely like spoken about what are the health disparities that 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 arise and we have not just spoken about it in a very general sense but also very particularly spoken about reproductive health about sexual health about chronic conditions about mental health you know things that are really important and see how we are able to marry all of that together and see what the huge problem is, you know, uh, overall, and we were able to sort of give our recommendations and definitely they are not like our personal recommendations. Obviously, they were all evidence based peer reviewed and, you know, we we had we conducted focus groups. So we had we had all of the community participation here as well, because this was a community based research uh, project. And so with I can definitely say with conviction that, you know, this is a very solid piece of work that we have done. And uh, and definitely all of the practitioners here have put in their all. I mean, I can definitely say that uh, for a fact they've they've given a lot into this project as well, because our ultimate goal is to is to see a better place for for LGBTQ BPOC. And as an organization, that's what we strive to do every day. And thinking about what can we do differently, what can we do to go a step further is is where you know we we. We brought this project together, and uh, we are presenting the, the the report here. And and definitely, I know it's the, the reason why we are presenting it, presenting it to you all of you is that we know this will definitely benefit um, a lot of organizations, and this could definitely prompt all of us to sort of going into the root cause of creating an evidence base to create data. I mean, to actually let people know that. This is what the issue is, and this is what we need to focus on. And that's that's definitely what we were also uh, going for. And having uh, having an evidence based about um, uh, all of these health disparities, having data present, they will definitely be valuable, you know, in in academic literature as well. Uh, and it can be, you know, it, it can help various different researchers to to use you know different different methods of uh, say for example when we know that we have less data this could be used to you know recruiting see how we can you know uh, help in like improving uh, recruiting different samples or you know trying and capturing the data that's that's there within the marginalized population so definitely we did speak about all of the health disparities giving recommendations and all of that but also we were looking at the bigger problem as to how we can sort of fill in that gap where there is no data for LGBTQ black people of color when it comes to health. So this is what we were going for. And, and I really hope this uh, this report is is super useful for everyone. And uh, again, I can say with full conviction that we have given <laughs> we have tried and given our best to this. And this is a properly evidence based peer reviewed um, study. And, and I really hope all of you will benefit from that. Thank you so much, Samia. That's a very, very thorough, is what I would say. So, uh, you know, and obviously, uh, you know, Samia can't stress enough, um, you know, what, why so much work has been put into it. And it's really because um, we don't do this full time. I think people don't realize that we don't do this full time. And actually, if, if there was one report that was written by one person, I'm sure that someone who is, you know, paid to do this for a full time on a, in a full time capacity could do that. Um, unfortunately, um, we've had to pull together all of our time um, to ensure that, you know, um, we can uh, collectively almost act as one person. Uh, and that's due to lack of funding. That's due to lack of 
um, you know, attention to this matter. I think that there's, um, there tends to be quite a lot for sort of maybe um, racial sexual, um, sorry, racial minority, uh, racially minoritized groups, but also sexually minoritized groups. We're operating at the gap of those two things. And so it's trying to justify what it must be like to be someone who exists at that intersection and how you sort of may be forced to go into either one of those two services but not maybe completely understood and so that's why we've um we've created this initiative so i'm going to move along um from that thank you so much samia that's really helpful and i'm going to hand across to gina who's going to do a quick little mentee poll for us so um gina yep okay hi everyone so we're going to do three questions today if that's okay and so the first one um is question one here and Whenever you're ready, you can have your uh, phone on the camera app and you can scan the QR code. And just in case that doesn't work, I have put in the link for the first question in the chat and you can also do that on your laptop. So whenever you have that open, could you please just answer the first question, which is how would you describe yourself? A service provider, a service user, both or neither. And once I get a few of the results in, I'll just read that out to everyone and just say what's been chosen the most, and then we can move on to the second question. Okay, so I have seven answers so far, 10 answers so far, and the majority said both, and three people said service provider. Um, I'll wait for a few more seconds, and then we can go on to the next one. Nope. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. One more said service user. Yep. I think that's all now. So uh, if we go onto the next slide, please. Thank you. And once again, um, if you could please just scan this uh, code or use the link that I've put into the chat. Um, the question is, what words come to mind when you think of the ideal LGBTQ plus health wellbeing service for black and people of color? And you can answer multiple times. So I'll read a few once I get some. So some of them so far, uh, words include non-existent, bespoke, targeted, Understanding, safe. Representative, peers. Inclusive, not separate. And once again, uh, culturally competent. Okay. Um. Accepting open-minded listening. Yeah, we got a lot for that. I'll just wait for a few more seconds just in case anyone else has something to add. And then we'll go on to the final question. Nope, okay, I think that's it. So uh, if we can go on to the third slide, please. And once again, this is the same uh, QR code and the same link as the second question. So if you just click on next question on your phone or tablet, it should come up. And the question is, do you think it matters if LGBTQ plus black people of color health services are run slash facilitated by individuals from similar backgrounds? I have one answer so far and somebody said maybe. A few more answers include, it matters for BAME services according to the NHS, and somebody said it can help. Another one, it needs to at least be informed by them. Any more? I'll just wait for a few more seconds and then... Oh, 
I don't think there's any more for that. Okay. Nope. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much, Gina. Thank you. Um, so well done. Okay, so I'd like to just um, move along to the next section where we're going to be looking at the perspectives of health, well-being and equality for LGBTQ+, Black and people of colour, and, and some of the people who contributed to, um, as authors to this report, unfortunately couldn't make it due to other personal issues or a conflicts of, 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 of timetable, not of interest, of timetable, um, but uh, I'm hoping that those who are, have been able to join tonight have, um, uh, have perspectives that they'll be able to share. Um, um, about why they wrote what they wrote within that section of the report and potentially um, um, have a, a little window to answer questions and also provide some examples of some of the recommendations um, that um, are featured in the report as well. So the first one um, is Lewis. So I've, um, I've actually asked, Lewis is actually with clients right now, unfortunately, um, as it's uh, not quite the end of the working day for him. Um, but we really wanted to emphasize in the report, encouraging participation in research. And uh, we talk about, uh, you know, not having sufficient research. We know that when people say that there's no basis or justifiable reason for us um, providing services for LGBT and Black people of color as an intersection, because there's no data. The reason why there is no data is typically because um, of a lack of engagement in that research. And so I would like to just hand across to Sarah and just see if Sarah can just give us a bit of a brief um, background on why sort of um, health um, uh, research and um, participation in health research can sometimes be compromised and sometimes contribute to um, sort of further health inequalities, um, just in some of the work that, that she does. Um, Sarah, is that okay if I hand across to you? Yes, so, you know, as we've heard a few times uh, in this uh, meeting so far, um, the issue of, of not only addressing individuals who are part of a ratio ethnic minoritized group, but also a sexually minoritized or sexual minoritized group um, presents even a more specific type of needs that exist. Um, so when we talk about chronic disease management, which is the area that I um, spoke about in this report, um, oftentimes we're generalizing, we're making generalizations about physical um, attributes of individuals. We're making generalizations about access to care, about uh, medication therapies. Um, but, um, and, and yes, that can be helpful um, in order to uh, do things at a, at a greater scale, at a national or a government um, level. But when we're talking about individuals, when we actually pare down, and, and that's Harvey said, when we actually are able to get that evidence um, in order to look at individuals on um, a, a more individualized or customized level, then we realize that some of these generalizations don't work, they don't apply. Um, and that's definitely been the, um, some of the things that have stood out um, to me that as, a, as, a, as a, a practitioner, as a public health practitioner, and as one who has been in the primary care setting for a few years now, I realized that, um, that you know, sometimes we, we aren't given the freedom to ask those questions to say, okay, when was this initially um, decided upon or when were these particular conclusions made, you know, in decades past when, the um, study members were of a more homogenized group of people. Um, it's hard to be able to ask those questions because you know when you're in the clinical setting, it's all about just providing that care. Um, but uh, but I am so appreciative of spaces like this where we can start asking those questions and saying no wait. Um, whether it's things like BMI, whether it's things like uh, kidney function and, th and things of that nature, um, that we can actually look at um, these things and say, okay, let's see um, whether these are the best approaches for our um, populations um, and so that we can provide better care. That's ultimately what we are here to do. We're not here to just continue um, delivering uh, mediocre care to our our uh, users. We want to actually improve. We want to improve the health, whether it's physical, mental, or sexual health. We want to actually improve that, and we need the information um, and the ability to ask those questions to be able to do so. So uh, those are some of the things that um, come out to me uh, as it relates to the chronic disease and overall health disparity arena. So you, you, you touched quite a bit on chronic uh, conditions and illnesses. And I think that, you know, you spoke about BMI, you spoke about um, kidney function. These are really uh, great examples that I know that Dorothy Roberts mentions in her, um, her video 
um, which is all about sort of the problem with race-based medicine. Um, and I think that when we talk about research, talk about assuming that people are hard to reach, you know, we, we talk about people being marginalized as, um, as Sammy mentioned earlier on, uh, when it comes to getting people to participate in surveys, to get, getting people to join focus groups and give their story and they, they, they sort of do an outpouring of their lived experience and then they don't see it appear in any place. You know, um, I think what Lewis referred to in specifically in his section was really how do we get people to get into research without getting what, what we're referring to as consultation fatigue? People are so, so over consulted that, you know, you almost can't ask them another question because they won't engage again because they, they've said it already. How do we get people to, how would you say we can get people to engage further? I know that you work with specific groups as well um, around diabetes education uh, and you often face the same barriers of getting people into services. How do we get people into research, not just conducting research, which is a miracle in itself, as we've done um, as people of color, definitely, but how do we get the participation and get the stories and, and encourage people to continue to, to contribute to that evidence base as it builds and as it grows? I think something that um, has been overlooked in the medical community and talking about the physical, um, physical health aspect is that we don't often recognize that individuals are not just one thing. They're not just their physical health um, but they were affected by their social circumstances, their environment, their finances, all of these things play a role in um, what we are looking at as far as their physical health. Um, and so uh, if we are trying to uh, pull people in for, to say, hey, we want you to be a part of, of this research, we want you to come out for care, individuals may prioritize what's immediately pressing to them, and it might not always be that that molecule or that hormone or that protein in their body that they can't see or feel. Um, so helping them address, okay, is, are there social barriers that we can help you with, point you to resources for? Um, are there um, financial constraints that we can help address? Um, no, we don't expect medical uh, practitioners or general practitioners to answer all of those questions. But at the very least, being aware of them, we can then point people to resources so that if we can help at least start addressing some of those things, then maybe they are more likely to say, okay, now I can give attention to um, the, the study that you want me to participate in or the, the screening or the medical test that you want me to have done. Very nicely put. Thank you so much for that contribution, Sarah. I'm going to move right along to, and Sarah's already touched on this, and again, um, Dr. Projector was not able to be with us this evening, uh, you know, but I, I think that it's, if it further is to the point that even for us to be able to scrape together at the end of a work day into a, into a place like this to discuss things that are really near and dear to us, it's a sacrifice and it really can, can, can really take a toll on us. Um, and and um, but in Productor's case, obviously, um, um, Productor's provided a lot of guidance on not just reproductive health, but on, on clinical health information and, and really has um, helped us to review some of the guides that we have to ensure that they're, um, they're up to standard. I'm just going to move right along to Kevante in that case. Um, Kevante is our external comms and, and social media officer. Uh, and wrote a section, two sections actually, one on decolonizing um, the colonized and also uh, another section on the power of LGBT um, BPOC terminology and language and how important that is. So I just want to ask um, uh, Kevante to join us. We're going to try and find you. Okay, there you go. Uh, and I'll just hand across to you if you can just give us a little synopsis of your section, what you wrote, why you wrote it, and why this has been important in this process. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, hoping that everyone can hear me properly and clearly. Um, so yeah, I was tasked, um, given this wonderful opportunity to write the sections on um, decolonizing the colonized and LGBTQ plus black and people of color um, terminology and its importance. And so I'll start with LGBTQ plus black and people of color terminology. Um, and just by kind of stating what is known, but just like driving the point home that language is important and that it helps to shape perception. And so the whole um, reason for writing this uh, part of the report was to just kind of bring, bring people back into remembrance that for LGBTQ plus um, black and people of color specifically, language helps to valid validate our perceptions of ourselves and it helps to reaffirm our existence, basically. So within this section, we kind of get into um, learning the language, the different terms, their meanings and appropriate uses. Um, so terms like 
queer and questioning intersects, um, what it means to be cisgender, what it means to be um, trans in that umbrella, the importance of pronouns, etc. All of that we get into um, within that section. What it what um, what is orientation? What are the different types of orientation? Um, etc. And giving people the guidance to know how to navigate conversations successfully when speaking to um, LGBTQ plus um, Black and people of color. Uh, when we get into the section about decolonizing the colonized, um, this section was incredibly important for me to write just because this is kind of like the whole basis of what Black Beetle Health is. Decolonization is based on the practice of social justice and Black Beetle Health is an organization that is definitely founded on that principle moving um, within like decolonizing health, well-being and equality for queer people of color. And so um, parts of the section about decolonizing the colonized kind of talks about what decolonization is and just like pointing out the fact that colonization is incredibly pervasive um, and that it basically, um, basically what it is, is invaders um, coming into land and penetrating people, cultures, belief systems, ways of doing things, penetrating them with their own beliefs to get them to move far away from who they actually are. And so within that, within the realm of health and well-being and equality, we understand from what Dr. Samia has said that um, health interventions in today's day and time that are created by practitioners who not necessarily look like um, Black and people of color and who may not identify as queer. Um, it's important that we understand that decolonization helps us to understand the needs of these, of these people. And I like that um, Harvey has said that we are not marginalized people, we are people who are marginalized. So people who are pushed further into the margins who don't necessarily understand that there are ways that they can get help and resources within health, within sexual, mental, reproductive health. Um, this is what the section is kind of talking about. And <clears throat> it goes further into just how, um, just how much this research is basically important. Um, in terms of recommendations, I think that the greatest recommendation, which is also a part of this report um, that I could give in regards to just the colonize and colonize and why LGBTQ plus language is incredibly important is understanding that um, we have to actively seek to reduce barriers to engage and draw on local community assets, collaborating with those most at risk. So it's about in, in, ensuring that practitioners within the field are using the right language to address the people that they're supposed to be giving aid to, ensuring that um, the things that they are suggesting to people are with are helping them and not making them to feel more marginalized. Um, and yeah, that we continue this work in just like a social justice way. Um, thank you. Yeah, definitely what you're saying in a, in a social justice at the forefront of, of, of our vision. And I think that what you're referring to there is when things get fluffy, it's really nice to create a service within the service. And it's nice to say that we've done that. But if it's fluffy and it's and it's cute and it's nice and it's sweet, uh, we have to really be questioning whether or not it's, it's serving a purpose there. It's not just to, as a, you know, as we say, a tick boxing exercise, which is great. It's almost overused. It's exhausting is how I describe that when you're trying to turn a system from the inside out, which is why the, the, the report is called Inside Out. Um, uh, you know, in, in, you know, partially called inside out, um, but also because, you know, many of us are inside these institutions where we're, we're inside and we're trying to, you know, work on things from the inside out, but we also face oppression in those spaces. Um, and I know that in my situation, I might be maybe in a better position to, um, you know, feel like I can, I can maybe challenge certain things or question certain things in my space within the NHS, which I'm perfectly happy to, to, to state that that's where I spend a lot of my time, if not most of my time. Um, but again, it's a journey and we can utilize these spaces and these conversations as tools to improving um, the spaces that we exist, even outside of the Black Beetle Health sphere. So thank you so much for sharing that, um, Kevante. Um, 
I'm just going to move along to um, Yu Yi now. So um, Yu Yi, um, I don't even know how I can begin to describe the importance of Yu Yi's role um, and Yu Yi's background and the education um, that uh, Yu Yi has brought to this space. Um, because Yu Yi is the person who's um, designed this entire report and done the graphic design on it. So over to you, Yu Yi, please tell us um, um, your thoughts on visual inclusion and, and how important that was in the creation of this report as well. Hi, as Harmi said, I'm Yi, I'm the graphic designer and I made the, I formatted the report and put all the visuals in and um, gathered all the documents or text that was sent over to me just to format it all together. And honestly, it really is, I find it really is important to have that visual representation, especially for black and people of color who are part of the LGBT plus community. And I think, especially I think one thing that's really important is because of how dominated in a lot of spaces, how white dominated it is in a lot of spaces or Eurocentric it is. So people tend to either picture or see a lot more white people in spaces. So to not really see someone who looks like yourself or someone who could relate to you can be a bit daunting or it creates some sort of distance. So obviously having like visual representation just to see, oh yeah, there's someone who I know, or someone who probably like I know from my family or like my friends I can probably trust this place or I can feel some sort of connection that I might be able to um, feel safer in this area they might have something that's in that is related to me like I'm also a non-binary person myself if I know people who are um, LGBT plus um, I will feel comfortable around I'm also biracial so I feel like if I know other people who are biracial or so Chinese they're like going to be some relatability in, in certain areas and um, so that's one of like the main important things and also I feel like as well with um, especially in looking at posters and such for health and such even when you have different people in sometimes you also don't really at least very visually notice whether they're LGBT plus as well so that's another thing you can also you can have like a lot of visual images for people who are from different ethnic backgrounds and different races but at the same time you still probably won't know um, what the situation might be like if you are from an LGBT plus community, how would they treat you in terms of your healthcare, if you're transgender or if you're not straight. And um, so I think it's just also seeing people who are part of that community as well is very important. And especially when going through the report and seeing a lot of their experiences, what it's like, even so you go to a practitioner who might be, um, even in the same community as you in one aspect, but not in the other, in the other aspect. So you could be a person of color and, but if you're going to, if you're going to someone who, um, if you're a person of color and you're part of the LGBT community and you go to someone who is part of the LGBT, the LGBT plus community and they're white, there's gonna be like um, a bit of diff, there's probably going to be like whether they'll understand fully your background, your needs and like the type of culture you're from. And again, if you go to see a medical practitioner who's of a, the same ethnic background as you are, but they're not, haven't been trained in sensitivity on how to deal with um, um, the culture or maybe your background as being someone from the LGBT community, it might be a lot different in um, trying to explain things for them or your um, what your reality is towards what they might think your what they might perceive your reality to be but then also as well not everyone's a monolith so there's always going to be even people who are in the same community as you is always going to look different be different have different aspects so to visually see different people and officially see someone similar to yourself it's always going to be an important thing because it helps you let you know there's going to be different people different experiences and there's going to be people just like you and it's just it does help open up a lot more conversations and trying to see what barriers there are. And um, yes, so that's one of the main important things with the, it's um, putting the report together. And I also think as well, what's also important as well when adding in certain images as well, adding in parts um, that are directly from Black Beetle Health, like what they've done and showcasing that just to show people what we have done or what have, um, like Harvey's, Harvey's images is in the report showing how he's gone and spoken to people and the amount of people that have come and probably have learned something. It shows an impact of what we have done and it just shows how far we can go and probably how far we can hopefully reach people as well. In, um, 
with um, all these images and just information and that sort of thing. So yeah, it's just hopefully putting this all together. It's like making sure people can see something that they could relate to, they could forward it off to someone else that they might think be able to relate to knowing that they're not alone and that someone they know won't be alone. And it's just, yeah, it's just sometimes being told one thing and then actually seeing it happen in real life can be two different things entirely. So it's usually important to make sure that you definitely see the things happening or you definitely see there is proof behind words and such. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. You thank you so much for that. That you mentioned that you know it's nice to be sort of an LGBT black and person of color who goes into a space and you might see somebody. One of the quick, one of the one of the key questions that we actually asked in the report, and it was an interesting response, and I want you to listen really closely to this. We actually asked the participants, and we said the same question that you've answered earlier on today's presentation. Do you think it makes any difference? If you go into a service, whether it's be sexual health service, mental health service, uh, you know, something for chronic illnesses, pain management, you know, something like that. Do you think it makes a difference if you go into a space as an LGBT, uh, LGBTQ plus black and person of color and your practitioner is, um, is also LGBTQ plus black and black and person of color? They're from the same as that background, same experiences. And what they said was, that's really great in theory, but it does not. Um, it doesn't mean that 100% it's a safe space, but there's still um, a likelihood that something could happen, that someone could say something that could be off-putting, that someone could experience something. And, you know, and that was due to what they referred to as over-familiarity over familiarity and so that's something that's really important that I think I want to highlight and it's written there in the report on the maybe the first section of the um, just before the focus group section where it really elaborates on you know okay so we've asked you know would it be perfect then if, if the person had the same identity and the answer was not 100% yes and and it's really important for us to emphasize that that is simply what the results say and so you know I myself as many people in the space will, will agree have gone to practitioners who have not been LGBT or a black or first of color either one of the intersections the characteristics and I've had fantastic service okay it's not to say that you know we're trying to you know uh, sort of say people have to look like us for us to have positive experiences absolutely not please have a look at the report that section where it really emphasizes people's experiences because that I think is the crux of uh, of the findings which is that you know uh, there's there's still a responsibility even for people who are lgbt bplc practitioners that we still have a responsibility to make sure that we are professional we are facts we, we're evidence-based we're giving people facts we're signposting we were being respectful and we're asking the same questions that we're asking everyone else to ask so it's not by identity that you are given some license but really it's through um through proper practice and best practice that you're actually given license um to be a sort of um, uh, seen as culturally safe or practicing um a, a culturally um, sensitive way so just wanted to point that out but thank you so much to you for, for adding that i think that was a, a perfect re representation of um sort of the visual element of the report there and, and the reasons behind that thank you so much i'm gonna um go back to sarah now uh, you know i know sarah touched a bit on sort of chronic conditions um but we want to really understand the impact of chronic conditions when it comes to people who uh, might present to sexual health services or they might pre present to um, mental health services or, or uh, um, in some other capacity but they also bring with them chronic pain. They also bring with them, maybe they're living with HIV. They also bring with them um, uh, maybe um, a mental health diagnosis. And, you know, they've come into a certain space for one thing, but it really requires a practitioner to maybe take um, what's called a multi-modal approach. So looking for one thing, treating for one thing, but also looking for another thing and being able to make recommendations. So I just want to pass to Sarah now to see, um, uh, you know, what what is the impact of things um, like chronic pain, HIV, um, diabetes, on other aspects of care? Yeah, um, thanks for that question. You know, as I mentioned earlier, um, it's so important for practitioners to not treat uh, in silos, um, but treat a person holistically. And of course, yeah, again, as a public health practitioner, I uh, like to look at the big picture of that. It's challenging in the current healthcare space in which we are today, where um, practitioners are measured by how many people they see, by the time frames, by deliverables, by um, certain quotas and things like that, that they, you know, that's the reality as well. It's, um, there's, there's ec economics attached to that as well. But um, hopefully what we, uh, want to reiterate with this report is that, um, yes, while there are certain deliverables that have to be met, we also have to look at the quality of the care that we are able to 
um, deliver, not just uh, perpetuating and, and helping people uh, continue to return to services for, uh, for treatment, but actually help them to manage um, and actually uh, have a better quality of life as a result of addressing those various um, factors um, as a whole. Um, so, you know, chronic uh, disease management um, tends to um, sometimes may, uh, you know, subconsciously suggest that particular communities of people may be the, to blame for why they have certain conditions. Um, you know, we hear the same terminology. This particular group of, of, of uh, this particular community um, is more likely to have this. This particular community is more likely to have that. And so uh, sometimes because, again, going back to evidence, uh, because there's sometimes a lack of evidence or a lack of training, there's a suggestion that it might be because of something that they are not uh, doing or something that's been made about them. But when we have better um, evidence and we have better training, then we can actually um, say, okay, what other factors surrounding this are, are affecting these individuals' outcomes and how can we approach them better um, with more cultural competence, as that term was used earlier, in order to um, address some of these surrounding factors so that it's not just um, dismissed as, okay, there must be something made about this particular population, but um, what is the, what can the healthcare community do as a whole to um, improve their quality of life? So as far as action points, yes, it's um, it has to do with the training and education of the personal provider, not just um, having that representation, although that representation and increasing the number of practitioners that are in these spaces is so key, um, but also having that um, that training of, of, of independent practitioners, but then addressing the structure um, on the next level up, because some of these um, societal um, issues are are at a greater level. So um, for even practitioners of this space or, or those who are representing on this call today, as you go back to your organizations and influences of, I mean, spheres of influence, you're able to take those uh, messages back and, and uh, pass that on to other people in positions of power that um, we need, we need um, more um, educate, excuse me, um, organizational uh, cultural differences as far as the, the culture of an organization, um, the, the imagery of an organization and how we address the users who then patronize those services. So um, those are some of the, the take home points. Um, we need the individual practitioner training. We need um, societal or um, training on the, uh, or interventions on the level of, um, uh, of uh, people of power. And then we also need better representation uh, in order to address um, chronic conditions as a whole and just better manage and improve quality of life, not just continuing to perpetuate these same conditions. Very eloquently put. Thank you so much, Sarah. And I'll, I'll not add not a thing to that because that was that was uh, yeah, that was perfect. And I'll encourage you to read more about um, this in in the section that Sarah's written on chronic conditions in the report, please. Um, Adelaide um, um, has. Um, done quite a lot of work around um, black maternal health, reproductive health and justice. Um, um, Adelaide is a midwife. Um, she's also a uh, midwife for the, for the NHS and also leads on reproductive health um, here at Black Beta Health. Um, due to personal reason, um, I just want to keep Adelaide in your thoughts today um, as she's not been able to make us uh, make it this evening. Um, but um, um, I put together a bit of a video of some work that she's done previously. It's about three minutes um, that just sort of explains the work that Adelaide does um, and addresses some of the things that were mentioned in the report um, that uh, both Projecta and um, Adelaide worked on. So um, let's just listen to it now. My name's Adelaide. I'm a registered midwife. So everybody, this is Dr. Annabelle Shonimo. You uh, were the founder um, of this kind of community interest group. You're also uh, a doctor of sexual and reproductive health. People yeah. can say that, you know, services are accessible and people are equal and why does that matter? Uh, it does matter because, especially for minoritized groups, because there's such that long history of you know sometimes mistrust or you know um not the system's not really being set up or inclusive for them that they don't necessarily feel needed and welcome and actually having that diverse representation can be like quite an obvious stepping stone yeah. to bring people in in the immediate way into a service and make them feel included. Obviously those are some of the barriers people face as well as 
just the more general things, you know, research not really necessarily including the right people, so people yeah. feel their experiences are spoken about, or certain medication, or things are for them. So those are the those are the common things. Yeah, it's really interesting that you kind of touch on um, the idea of like underrepresentation within like research and stuff like that, because I think that's a, a huge thing. And we kind of come across information. So, for example, um, within, you know, maternity care that black women, you know, are five times more likely to die, you know, in pregnancy in six you know weeks after than their white counterparts. And kind of we've got this information and then... That's kind of it. No one else is sort of, you know, doesn't feel like there's anybody else doing anything that, you know, research is often motivated by money and outcomes. And so, you know, who is going to benefit by us sort of delving into that, particularly if it sort of brings up maybe a systematic bias, which is much more difficult to correct than putting money into a particular care pathway or, or something like that. And um, I, I just wondered if there's a particular, um, you know, a particular statistic or a particular topic in kind of that sort of reproductive health that you found sort of quite shocking. Because when I share that stat with people, like they often find it really. So that's, that stat is so shocking. And it's resonated particularly for the last year post the embryo report. And it's been really yeah. important driving conversation and debate and things like that forward so I'm really really glad that like you know people are listening because of that statistic it's harder to advocate for yourself you kind of do what someone says because you're worried about like your unborn child and things like that what I find even kind of some sometimes more frustrating is that it took that statistic for people to listen or it's then taken that statistic for people to have this conversation about healthcare more broadly and yeah. that statistic was banded about flying around a year before we saw COVID in a policy yeah. statistic, for example. For some of us that work in healthcare, work and talk about healthcare inequality, it was just like these statistics now that we've been around COVID are quite unsurprising. Yeah, and absolutely. Feel like it takes these, like, so COVID, you see in like black populations or black uh, people who all times like, die poor outcomes because of COVID and that was like really big statistic and it's frustrating that it takes like these really obvious health inequality statistics for people to kind of observe what is quite a clear obvious profound trend organizations like the British Association of Sexual Health and HIV produce guidelines for trans and non-binary folk this year um, a lot of people are reading it um, people that are older are trying to educate themselves. There are people mm -hmm. in the system that yeah. are you know, around trans health, for example, are trying to educate themselves more. We don't have like, necessarily the clear pathways that we require or we'd like to do these things properly, but they are emerging. Oops. Okay, yeah, brilliant. So I, I just had to share that segment with you. I, I wasn't going to settle for Adelaide not being able to make it tonight, but I think that that conversation, um, it goes on for about about 40 minutes, I think, um, like in total, and you can access that on our YouTube channel. And I would really encourage you to listen to that dialogue between Adelaide and Dr. Annabelle Solimimo, um, just about reproductive health and justice. Um, I just want to, so I, I'm looking at the time uh, for us now, and I just want to bring it all back to innovation uh, and being innovative in, in community interventions. I know that many people on this call today will have, uh, you know, maybe submitted a bid or been, a, you know, part of a project where a bid has been submitted. And the first way that they add on there is, you know, give us an example of something innovative, give us something new, give us something, you know, that's really a uh, flash that we can really be impressed by. Um, and as we, you know, look at Black Beta Health as an example of a community um, sort of an initiative um, that's been innovative, I like to believe that it's been, um, you know, community led, I like to believe that it's been evidence based, it's been a labor of love, all of those great things. And we've seen some new things come out of it. There's nothing like the good old way of doing things, which is listening, um, leading with empathy and compassion, um, and being proactive and moving with the intent to improve. And uh, if we ever think about, uh, you know, some of the uh, examples that we see, um, there is no intent to improve because we know that uh, a lot of times um, the system is fed by health inequalities and if you fix too many problems we'll have nothing to try to fix and, and that can be um, sort of um, economically damaging um, for us as a society. 
But we've got to really think about um, equity more than equality and, and how that affects all of us. Um, when we think about innovation, yes, we've seen lots of videos come out. We've seen lots of um, examples of of documentaries or uh, you know um, the way that data has been collected, the reports have been written. There's been projects and the community care packages schemes you know gone out. You know these are examples of things that we've done, but we've seen other people doing them as well. So you know as far as it being innovative, um, thinking about who's leading the work that that we see happening, um, who is um, being pushed forward. Is there a opportunity for capacity building? Is there a, is there a sort of um, the, the power struggle, is that being addressed in the process? Who are we letting speak in a space? Are we um, okay with someone maybe not getting all of the language right or maybe getting all of the, you know, uh, you know the, the, the boxes ticked in the way that a report should be written or an intervention should be done? Um, but are we looking for opportunities to develop people in our teams or are we only saying, oh, we haven't got capacity, we haven't got the right skill set, we haven't got the right um, vision? Sometimes it's better to do um, uh, what you can do and let people um, who are representing these groups um, to really lead on the, on those pieces of work rather than maybe thinking what's not working um, and then maybe taking over that space and saying, well, I'll do it. I think I can do a better job because representation really matters. And that's the most innovative thing that we can see um, at the community level. Um, uh, when it comes to innovation, uh, there are several recommendations that come through in the uh, toward the end of the report. There's about three, uh, three pages across all areas, um, but within the community intervention sphere, it really points to um, uh, what you might have heard of, which is uh, the ladder of citizen participation, which is really Sherry Arnstein's 1972, uh, you know, model that is, think about it, 1972. How innovative is that? That's in the 70s, but the same rule still applies. When we talk about community-based asset mapping, I know that's something I, I got a chance to do during my time at LGBT Foundation, and that was very much led um, within the, the PASH partnership there, actually, um, was looking at what communities already have and trying to figure out ways in which to empower them to utilize those resources. That's also part of the Health Matters guidelines that came out of Public Health England. This is not something that's new. It's led by that, that, um, that same concept um, that Sherry Arnstein really um, initiated many years ago. And it's really returning full circle back to that, in, uh, that innovation and thinking, all right, what do people have in their, in, in their wheelhouse? What skills can we develop? How can we mobilize people in a way that they benefit and, and, and maybe the system doesn't benefit, but those people actually directly benefit? How can we ensure that people see um, the result of their, uh, their influence uh, and can recognize change when it happens? Um, and think about how, um, how we can avoid feeding systems and feeding institutions and really be become brave enough to become part of those that, um, that challenge uh, the things that, that, that sort of challenge equity um, and, and compromise um, equality for, for various populations, but in particular LGBTQ plus black and people of color here, because that's who we're talking about today. So um, I just wanted to just um, direct you further to any of the recommendations that are in, the, in the, the report. We do want you to reference them. We do want you to read them. We want you to digest them and ask questions um, along the way. Um, just a few reflections from the session, um, just one or two minutes, and then we're going to open the floor up. Um, probably 30 seconds, Sammy actually will open the floor up to any questions. I've not been able to see the chats, but um, um, hopefully if anyone has any questions, we can answer them just in the few minutes that we have left. So just about 30 seconds, please, Sammy. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, first of all, I would like to thank everyone uh, of you for uh, for making um, uh, to, to the session today, and uh, I, I really hope that you would take full advantage of this of this work, and not only just like stop there, but then like take it forward and see what what we can do as as individuals, see what we can do as organizations, because I'm sure us coming together and doing this will uh, definitely have an impact, um, you know, for for the future as well, and uh, and. You've heard all of us uh, speak, all of the panelists speak, all of the authors, of the work uh, that we've done, uh, all of the efforts that we've put into this. And uh, like Javi mentioned at the beginning, uh, I mean, this this is something, uh, this is not a full-time job. Uh, and so it's it's uh, it's definitely been a challenge for us as well to, to sort of like try and prioritize this to to make sure that we give the best uh, available information there to make sure that everything is evidence-based and peer-reviewed. And I, I really hope this is beneficial for, for all of you. And um, uh, I, I'm sure this this will definitely pave the path, uh, you know, ahead for for any any future, you know, uh, academic literature uh, research that comes. And and I really hope again, uh, I hope all of you please take advantage of of this report that we've done and please take it forward. And you know, I'm I, I'm sure this uh, will definitely create uh, a difference in in what we do uh, in within the health services of uh, uh, you know LGBTQ plus uh, black people of color because at the end uh, all we are asking for is uh, is equity and uh, to be all of us to be able to come together and you know, 
that we have equal rights um, in, in all of this. So thank you uh, once again. And uh, and please, I encourage all of you to please ask your questions on the chat or you could you know to just just ask us questions. So opening the floor for uh, questions to, to any one of us.